baby's home Cairo Cairo is my baby's home One bad Cairo night won't be long Carol, they will treat you kind and sweet. Women in Carol, they will treat you kind and sweet. Catch you around and take you off your feet. and knock you, peach you and cut you too. Shoot and knock you, peach you and cut you too. They get through the graveyard then for you. Henry Thousand, fantastic song from one of his uh, later recordings, and um, I do recommend that you look him up and listen to his early works. So, uh, welcome. As you see, uh, we're going to have a blast today as well because uh, I'm bringing in my good friend and uh, distinguished musician colleague, Brian Kramer. We had some, some technical issues prior to the start here and apparently we cannot make it uh, so that Brian can play the guitar. Uh, it's something with the microphones and uh, it's just compressing that sound too much. So uh, we're gonna be talking a lot but there's so much interesting stuff that Brian can tell you about so it's, uh, it's gonna be good anyway. So I see my good friends here who usually come this early and Tom is back. Great to see you again, Tommy. Perfect. So, uh, without further ado, let me just play you the welcome song, which has a little connection to, to Brian because we've jammed over this song, uh, I, I guess, a couple of times. And the latest one, there's this video on YouTube on uh, from Stampen in Stockholm, where we were four on the scene playing hooray hooray this woman is killing me so that's coming up now as our welcome song as usually supported by sanding guitars and my small uh, merch slide villains that's soon coming out to you guys so let's do it <laughs> Come all once again, and let's do the hooray hooray. This woman is killing me. I met a pretty little guy walking down that avenue. I met a pretty little guy walking down that avenue. I said, Hello now, baby, can I go on home with you? She said, Yeah, yeah, Mac will rock and howl tonight. You know what I mean. Gonna rock and howl tonight. He got a gamer friend love and everything's gonna be alright. And we'll start after midnight rock to the break of dawn. Well, we'll start after midnight rock to the break of dawn. Well, you can't keep cool, cause I'm gonna keep you warm. Hooray, hooray, that woman is killing me. Hooray, hooray, this woman is killing me. Thank you. 
me five o'clock now, what you gonna do? That's us, Wasper. I said, five o'clock now, what you gonna do? She said, homesick Mac, I don't care if it's eight, man. I'll just leave it all up to you. I'm gonna lock this to go, wanna throw this key away. I'm gonna lock this to go, wanna throw this key away. Baby, I go home, I'll stay right here all day. So this song, uh, amongst a couple of others, is going to be one of my questions to Brian later on, because this is one of the trickiest uh, kind of ways of playing and expecting somebody else to accompany you and play along with you and take over some solos and whatever. So I'll, I'll be talking with Brian about this. So we are going to say hello to... One more of our frequent uh, visitors, actually my son. Hello, you're in Stockholm today. Great, you don't have your banjo with you, so you can't play along, okay? Right. We'll do one backup song, Slow Blues and E. So grab your guitars and let's jam. One, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. 
Well done. I have no idea. I hope you played with me. I really do hope. So let's not keep you all waiting. Let's bring in the one and only. There are no other <laughs> colleagues like him. He's got many talents. He's got a great hat. I love the guy. We've been knowing each other for many years now. So please welcome Brian Kramer. All right, I'll just bring you in with your audio as well. So here we go. Hi, Brian. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Great to see you. Great to be here. Hey, uh, I played along. You did. That's great. I played along. Uh, it, it was fun. I was like, uh, it put me in a nice state of mind. I was like, yeah. I was waiting for you to rip it up, but mm, it was good. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, this is uh, really thought uh, as a, a pure backup for people to either play a solo or sing a verse or something. And I usually choose either a slow blues uh, or maybe a moderate shuffle. And uh, sometimes it's this uh, Kansas City blues pattern, like, right. And um, so there's always this part of, of, of the live stream where people can just play along and have fun. Right. So how should we start? I have, I have zillions of questions uh, for you, but basically I prepared a little uh, history uh, through your career of the uh, picks that we got and uh, maybe we can just start from there All right sure. so here we are this is early brian kramer days this is 80s right tell us about so this picture here. yeah tell us about the picture well that was um in uh, 1988 in uh, new york city at baby munster studios downtown by Broadway Lafayette. And uh, that was during the sessions for my first album, Brian Kramer and the Blues Masters featuring Junior Wells. And this was uh, when we were basically, probably one of the first times we were listening to playback of some of the tracks. And yeah. uh, it was just a really great moment and everyone was just in a great frame of mind and just, it was, uh, unbelievably good feeling, yeah. you know, to have Junior on board and to you know have his support. Yeah. Tell us a little about uh, about uh, Junior Wells, uh, his his background and why he's so significant. Well, Junior was uh, uh, primarily uh, he had played with Muddy Waters when he was a very very young man, and um, mainly known i guess with his uh, buddy guy and junior wells like the original blues brothers of course and uh you know the first album that and for me it's probably the first and practically the last album the, one of my go-to records is hoodoo man blues uh, with uh, buddy and junior and when i was before i did my first gig when i was just learning uh, everything i could about absorbing the blues that was like you know, that was nourishment for me, you know, that record. And when I got to meet Junior and, you know, just it was and Buddy uh, back at that time in the 70s, it was just an unbelievable situation because, uh, you know, what I knew about him and, you know, just he was so good and so funky and just like powerful. And yet the it was electric blues, but I, I didn't differentiate back then between electric and acoustic blues because it was just so uh solid and sparse and uh you know it felt like they were making it up as they went along and yet it felt like all of their experience and knowledge for the music was right there with them at the same time so it's just yeah. a big yeah beautiful thing <laughs> yeah yeah i remember i remember um i i think i read somewhere uh, that uh, eric clapton and even Jimi hendrix were listening to buddy guy uh when he uh, started playing live, but actually, I know another story of, of Buddy Guy when he played with Muddy Waters as a sideman, and th that's also the reason why I'm digging a little bit deeper into this uh, photo because we're uh, through Junior Wells 
uh, and his connection to Buddy Guy were going back to Muddy Waters and the album Folk Singer, where it was what? like th three people, uh, Willie Dixon on bass, Buddy Guy on a, a backup guitar, and Muddy Waters uh, uh, singing and playing slide and playing the guitar. So uh, Buddy Guy had this sideman role in that context because... Uh, Willie Dixon just brought him, brought him in because uh, they wanted one more guitar. And I guess maybe Jimmy Rogers wasn't available or maybe it was uh, that time where when they didn't play so much together anymore, Muddy and, and uh, Jimmy Rogers, because uh, Little Walter, Jimmy Rogers and Muddy were the headhunters, right, of that time uh, playing in Chicago. So Buddy Guy uh, started off as accompanying Mighty Waters on, on that record and he was in the secret already but uh, I think it's about that time in the mid 60s that he he started with with Junior Wells right yes with that, band. that is yeah. that is also one of my favorite albums uh especially Buddy's uh, accompaniment playing he's so respectful and yeah. sparse yet interactive and there's so much not being said in that record that's so beautiful yeah but to, uh, the connection between those three musicians from what i understand of those sessions as well i believe yeah oh a funny story was that uh when i first met uh buddy and junior i had a copy of that album uh muddy uh, waters folk singer and i brought yeah. it and i showed it to buddy and he was like man yeah oh this was a great record he and he he said that muddy took a chance on him back oh, yeah. then because mm. uh i i don't think the uh, was it chess records was it or something uh I'm not I, sure, think so. but, I think it was still but chess they, records, want, yeah. they actually were were apprehensive or hesitant to mm -hmm. have buddy for some reason i yeah. think like you said they wanted like a, a seasoned pro but mighty wanted yeah buddy on that session and uh, he sort of took a chance on him but yeah. anyway i brought that album to buddy guy and buddy said you know i've never owned a copy of this record mm -hmm. he, said he, he actually <laughs> really? never owned the copy he didn't have a copy of it so i said well this is for you this is a gift so <laughs> the weirdest thing is usually when you meet your idols you want them to give you stuff and autographs so i'm giving buddy guy a, a copy of his own record that he never had before, <laughs> which is my one of my favorite albums that was cool that's cool Oh, great. And, but I, learned, I learned a lot off that record as well, you know, yeah. just like listening to how they interacted. And you mentioned Jimmy Rogers' role with Muddy Waters. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like the go to, you know, one two punch. Yeah. You know, of exactly. like, you know, of, you know, a blues accompaniment where it just all kind of, you know, just does a, a beautiful little dance. Yeah. We well, don't I, know who's playing uh, what sometimes and it sort of switches places. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because uh, that was also one of the observations that, that, that I had when it comes to that early uh, period of Muddy's career when he was, him him and Jimmy Rogers were playing uh, the backup, the licks, uh, the, the in-between licks, uh, some, some crazy turnarounds that were actually licks. And uh, they were kind of biting each other musically uh, all the time especially in the in the slow blues it was amazing i learned a lot myself there and uh, actually that gave me the courage to play more kind of uh, uh actively when backing up louisiana red later on when i was uh, you know going out and doing sideman jobs and all that so i played with louisiana in in uh, in germany in the uh, late 80s and early 90s and he he was always like hey man just play your butt off doesn't matter. Come on, come on, right? So uh, good. So we're yeah, we have one of the first, similar one of the first things I learned. Yeah. Yeah. But based on what you said, one of the first things I learned from Junior and from Buddy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as a young player, was the conversation of the blues. Was that you know had to have the ears of like you're having a conversation, not yeah. like you're trying to fill up the space with uh, with you know notes or something. Yeah. you know something substantial that that you figured out you yeah. know but that it's it's actually uh you know a conversation of the heart and soul first and yeah. foremost 
Yeah. You know, and that's like when when that's in the mind, then, you know, everything that you all your knowledge, you know, technically sort of kind of falls in line with that. Yeah. OK, keep this keep this thought because I'm going coming back to this later on. Let's go through some more images. Here comes uh, one of our both favorite uh, musicians. For, for my part, Larry Johnson was one of the first players I've heard. Uh, uh, along uh, Gary Davis and Bo Carter when I started and I just he thought he well. had such fantastic chord shaping and rhythms that was so driving on just one guitar so how did you meet Larry Johnson? Well Larry uh, I used to see Larry at this uh, little dive blues bar in New York City on the Lower East Side um, called Dan Lynch's Blues Bar. And uh, when I was like just a teenager and I was actually too young to be in there to, uh, you know, to drink, uh, me and uh, my buddies would go down there. We were learning about the blues. We never played gigs before. We were just, this was basically, I at that time, from what I remember, one of the only, if not the only place where mm. you could listen to blues practically every yeah. night of the week. Yeah. And uh, everybody went there. And it was a, it was like literally a little dive bar. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, there were so many great, great bands that played there. Uh, and just the music, you know, was, and they had also the first time I ever went to a blues jam session on a Sunday was at Dan Lynch's as well. But okay. it was when, uh, Larry Johnson, when I saw him play, he, he had a regular gig, I believe every week. And uh, when I saw him, that was when something tugged on me so strong, because I think that was the first time I'd seen and heard a musician make a guitar sound like an orchestra. Yeah. You know, like, you know, and I didn't know it at that moment, because like the first time I saw him, I was just dumbfounded uh, that you know, you could hear the bass runs and the treble runs and this rhythm thing going on. And then there's yeah. something else in there that you can't identify that's happening because it's just all in the mix. Yeah. And the way he sang on top of it. And uh, it was like, you know, tongue in cheek. It was serious. It was uh, humorous. You yeah. know, it was like, a, you know, this one, one guy, yeah. you know, one guy just playing like, you know, like all these like orchestrated parts and it was just so beautiful and soulful yeah. and then uh i bought his record fast and funky they actually sold it right there at the bar and uh i found out when you read the back of the record uh there were liner notes from reverend gary davis who it turns out was uh, larry johnson's mentor mm. so yeah. uh i went so i started listening intently to Reverend Gary Davis. And I started to understand, you know, where this concept is coming from in that yeah. regard. Cause I think back then I was listening to much more of like lightning Hopkins and Robert Johnson and, you know, like the, the Delta and the Texas blues songbook. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, muddy of course. But uh, then, you know, when I started taking Reverend Gary Davis and, you know, those kinds of ragtime pickers on board, it opened up my ears uh, in a whole whole different way. And I realized that's how I wanted to play. Or mm -hmm. I wanted to understand how to play that way. So I started studying Gary Davis and then like Larry Johnson's record was a staple. And what happened was I, got, I would see him every chance I would get. And Dan Lynch's was a really, really seedy place. It was in a seedy neighborhood. You know, you had to watch your wallet. You know, you could be, someone could pull a knife on you. You know, it's like anything could happen. Yeah. if you walked out the door in that place and i traveled there you know like an hour from brooklyn to get to this place and left there like at all hours of the night and you know like had like they served dollar draft beers and things like that and i was like i said too young to drink but you know i went with my friends and you know i would observe larry and larry also at that time he also worked they had a little three alarm chili station and hot sandwiches like okay. hot, hot french toast hot toast sandwiches and uh, ch chili, three alarm chili. It was really, really hot stuff. And he worked there and he, he did the prep for that. And he also like sold weed behind 
there <laughs> as well. Oh, I was orphan, but he was he was a very very touchy guy. I say in a very diplomatic way. I mean, he would he would. I saw him pull a butcher knife on some guy who owed him five bucks in Dan Lynch's, and you know, and just I was like. You know, I, I was too scared to like a, approach this guy. And uh, I'll give you the short story was that years mm -hmm. later, and this was after I made the first record with Junior Wells, right? This was no around the same time after the album was just released in like 1989, 1990, around that time. Yeah. Uh, I had been, you know, and I've been studying Larry for years and, you know, I made my first record and, you know, it's like, I was very happy and proud of, of the whole process. And I get a message from someone, I believe it was Adam Gussow, the harmonica player, oh, yeah. who also okay. knew Larry. And he said that Larry Johnson, he calls me and he says, Larry Johnson's been away in Europe for maybe about a dozen years, six or seven years. And he's just back in town and he needs a place to stay. Do I know anyone who has a place? And I said, give me a minute, I think I do. And a friend of mine had like a room to rent literally down the street from Dan Lynch's. And what I did was uh, I said, I have a place available and she's oh, okay. And he was like, Oh, that's great. You'll be helping Larry out a lot. And what I did was I had to go out to Brooklyn. Like I was living in the city at that time. And I had to go way out into Brooklyn to meet Larry and talk to him and tell him the situation. It was like, you know, and I went out to sit, to see him, and this was the first time that I'd actually saw, like, face to face, would talk to him. And I had with me a copy of my album uh, with Junior, and uh, I went to meet him, and uh, he was very nice and he was very appreciative. And I was like, I told him, look, I'm a big, you know, let me tell you, I'm a big fan of your music, and I've been listening to you since Dan Lynch's, and I'm a player. And I said, I want to give you this as a gift. I gave him the copy of the album. And he's looking at it and he's going, this is you. I'm like, yeah, that's me. I made this record with Junior Wells. And then he starts like getting very, you know, reminiscent. And he starts talking to me about his playing with Johnny Shines and how he did he oh, knew Muddy yeah. Water. And, and he had all these like stories. And he said, hey, let's listen to the record. And, you know, we put it on. He puts it on his turntable. And I'm like, holy shit. This is like uh, <laughs> a little bit freaking out because this isn't the kind of music that I thought I would want him to hear me playing. But you know, yeah. anyway, he's listening to it and he's skipping through the tracks. Basically, he's listening to like 10 minutes. That's good. Yeah, that's good. He goes in next to me. That's good. And then he gets to the last track on side B and it's a song with just me and Junior. And I'm playing like a national uh, duolian. And it's like a finger picking song in the key of A that I wrote called Lover and Friend, but it's based on Robert Johnson uh, style. Yeah. And it's just me and Junior, harmonica and guitar. And he says, he goes, that's you? That's, he's really listening intently and he's going, and he, he starts telling me, he hears that I obviously study this stuff. And like yeah. I said, I said, I studied you, things like that. Right there, I told him about the apartment, but I also had a string of gigs. He had no gigs. He hadn't mm. played in New York City in maybe seven years. I think he was living in Italy and yeah. working in Europe. And yeah. he had no gigs in New York. He had just come back. He had no pl steady place to stay. And yeah. I said, hey, I'm having some album release events for this. Uh, why don't you be the guest uh, on, on the bill for my shows? So I'll put, you know, I you know, I'll pay you and I'll book you on the shows and, you know, you can do a set. And he was like, he was very, very appreciative of that. And that yeah. was what happened was uh, we were at Tramps and this was the first gig back from Europe that he was doing and he was on the bill and he invited me. Is it okay if I go on with this? Cause it's a yeah, good yeah, story. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. He invited me, we, he was going to do a set and then I was going to do a set with my band, Brian Kramer and the Blues Masters, with Adam Gussow and my musicians at that time. And we're backstage, and he was sort of like, well, uh, I suppose uh, we should play something together. He was a little bit, like, reluctant, but he was like, well, uh, 
as a courtesy. He was like, I suppose we should play something together. <laughs> and I, oh, well, what can we do though? Like he, like almost like he, he was kind of apprehensive. And I saw he had a set list there. And I looked down and I saw uh, one of a few of the songs that I knew that I studied of his very intently that that I that I played and I studied. And I pointed to one called Charlie Stone, which is like one of his signature songs. And he's like, I said, how about this one? He says, you can't play that. I was like, no, no, I, I know that song. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been listening to it for years and I've been playing along with this. Like, so he was uh, he was almost to defy me. He picks up his guitar very proudly and he starts like playing into the song. Like, and I pick up my guitar and we're talking about what we're talking about in this show is we're talking about accompaniment, right? Yeah. And one of the things that I learned from listening to Reverend Gary Davis and Larry Johnson and certain players was, you know, that, you know, I learned that they played all their parts in first position, but also second and third positions. You know, they would dip into like second and third position. So I, I became fascinated with second position against first position playing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so like, if you're playing like a C chord, I'm playing like an A shape C chord, which yeah, I call second yeah. position, yeah, yeah. you know, on the whatever, on the fifth, sixth, seventh fret, whatever, yeah, I, I yeah. don't have the guitar with me. You yeah. know what I mean? So like learning all the same arrangements, but in second position and then in third position. Yeah. And so what happened was he started playing Charlie Stone and I start, and I picked up my guitar and I started accompanying him in second position and he was immediately perked up. And yeah. what happened was this happened and yeah. he liked it. And then we went through another song and we went through another song and he got up on stage and it started off where he was supposed to do the set, his set, and then call me up and add him up at the end for like maybe one or two songs. Yeah. What he did was he got up on stage and he enjoyed playing what we play backstage so much that he called us up right from the start of the set and we played the entire set with him. Yeah. And that was my, basically, that was my, like, pot, breaking my cherry playing with with Larry Johnson, yeah. an entire set. And like, just playing it that way. And that was, that created a relationship that lasted 15 plus years yeah. of us playing together. Yeah, that's great. Great story, and I'll, I'll be coming back to this little issue <clears throat> as well about playing in positions when accompanying people. So this is uh, you and Larry. Is this uh, Omol? It looks like this that, uh, exhibition Omol? hall. Or, I think no, Winstros, wasn't it? Uh, was it? This is no, this Omol. is no, this is Omol. That, this is Omol. That's Omol. Yeah. Omol. Yeah. Again, the other one was Omol as well. That was a workshop. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then Omol. this could be Monstros. Uh, yeah. Eric Lindahl's photo. Eric Lindahl, yeah. the photographer. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's we're a coming to. That's, yeah. a, that's a book within itself, that, that moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right. So Eric Bibb. Eric, yes. That was another, that was like another player who I, I've been fortunate, so fortunate to accompany. That was like basically going back to school, going back to college yeah. to get another degree. Because it was, a, it was a, in a way, a little bit of a similar situation when I had met Eric and, uh, you know, uh, when was this? This was like, you know, in 1988, 98, 97 or 98, something like that, we had met. And uh, it just turns out that we kept running into each other in Stockholm. And we realized we had so much in common and we'd like, we'd talk and we'd have coffee and, and he, and the, the thing was, he'd never heard me play, but we had a really, like, we had like a, a connection, yeah. you know, we had a, a really strong connection uh, that crossed so many paths. I mean, we literally lived around the corner from each other, like, but 10, 15, 10 years apart. And we knew yeah. all the same people, but 10 years apart. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard about him through these people. And of course, he never heard about me through these people. But we, after we knew each other, we realized we, like, we know a lot of, of the same people in the village in New York. And what happened was through this connection, 
uh, he was about to go on tour to play uh, uh, coast to coast, New York, California, when he was just signed to uh, something like, I think it was called Earth Beat Records or something like that. And um, yeah, what happened was uh, he, had ha he was having a fallout with his guitar player at the time, who was a brilliant musician, Euron Winnebrandt on the Opus 3 records, you know, oh, and he was a friend of mine as well. I met him when I first came to Sweden in 1990, so we became friends. He was Eric's guitar player. Something happened. Eric called me up and said, look, uh, I have a tour coming up in a few weeks, and uh, would you like to accompany me? I'd never played with him before. We never sat side by side with instruments. I don't even think he'd heard me play. But for some reason, just on faith and our connection and our conversations, he took a chance on me, you know. And what happened was uh, he gave me like a list of songs and I had some of his records that I picked up and I was studying the songs that we were going to do. But it was like, I think the day before we were going to leave, a day or two before we were about to fly to California to do our first show ever together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, this is nuts. What if we get there and it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. So I knew he was playing, I knew he was playing a, a, a fundraiser or a small private event or something at Mozabaka. Yeah. And what I did was I decided to crash the event. So I literally just showed up with a guitar and <laughs> I show up to Mozabaka and He's outside, I think, like taking a drag on a cigarette. He, he smoked once in a while back then. And he's like, oh, you're here. Well, we can play something. So Jenny <laughs> Bowman was there. Yeah. So what happens, we go into this tiny, tiny little dressing room or coat room, um, five, like five, 10 minutes before he's going to get up on stage. Me, him, and Jenny Bowman were yeah. squashed in this room. And we literally went through like 15, no, maybe even 10 seconds of like eight songs. And we'd start a song. He's like, yeah, okay, good. You got the picture. Okay, this is the next one. Yeah, okay, good. You got the picture. Yeah, this is <laughs> like literally 10 to 15 <laughs> seconds of each song. Oh, cool. What happens? He introduces me, Jenny. You know Jenny. Yeah. We get up on stage. And all I can say is, that everything that I'd hoped it would feel and sound like, it felt and sound sounded like to me. And uh, Eric was smiling. And I knew at that moment that, you know, what, what I was working on, because the thing was, when I was working on the songs and the records, I didn't want to repeat or sound like, it was the same thing when I played with, with Junior on his songs on the record. I didn't want to like, some of them were songs that he recorded with Buddy Guy, and I didn't want to repeat that. And uh, I wanted to find something that was more, you know, personal. Exactly. And with Eric, it was the same thing. I, I didn't want to repeat myself. So I was trying to, you know, discover something yeah. that I thought would fit. Because when you're playing with someone like Eric or like Larry or like Mac, like you, you know, the thing is, you're already a uh, self-contained musicians. You have it all going on. You're finger picking. You're like, you know, you have all the bases covered, so to speak. So yeah. what can you contribute to that that won't be a distraction from the thing that you're going to be doing naturally and exactly. easily and at the same time lift it up so that it feels more or better? Mm -hmm. Or, or like it makes you more inspired when you're playing it. That was the puzzle that, with Eric, that was a puzzle that I really was trying to uh, figure out because yeah. I was like, wait, you don't need another guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I've been listening to you all day long just by yourself. What the Yeah, fuck? exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so we played that first gig together or that gig that I crashed together, I knew it was working. I knew that, you know, what I was trying to, and, I, and I'll explain a little bit of what, you know, my, the philosophy behind that was, but it worked. And then we, we went on to like 
just play so many shows across the globe. And that was like going to college because that was the first time that I truly, truly realized and saw that uh, two people and someone as captivating and, you know, personalized as Eric can captivate like full houses everywhere or festivals. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of the time it was just the two of us. Yeah. And, you know, you, you know how it is. It's like you think you go into bars or pubs or things like that and people are going to talk over you. But yeah. Eric had a command and, you know, there was something about using that space and just mm -hmm. finding a connection with two instruments and, and the voice. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because uh, I thought uh, that playing with people like, like uh, Eric Bibb is so rewarding because it's not the idiom, it's not the, the blues. Of course, I still, and I will always think that blues is one of the most difficult musical styles and forms to play because it is a bit stiff, but then you have this total freedom within those frames for the blues. And that sometimes goes to that people play by filling every empty space there is because they are afraid that maybe they'll be judged then oh i'm not good enough i need to play more uh people aren't gonna like me and the first thing that i've always heard uh let's say original artists say is this take your time take your time and 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 uh, the, the, the way they can hang up in the uh, in the air with a note or two and just waiting for the right mood and vibration to come and that's a lot of when i listen to to eric big play solo he's like treating his guitar as an orchestra and it's very captivating it's very inspiring and he can really hang on a note for a long time so uh yeah actually amazing musician all right let's go let's go further on our mutual buddy, Bert Divert, also American yeah. guy in Sweden. Absolutely. You guys go way back, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the, the, the overlapping story is that uh, he played and recorded with Eric, you know, f on the first records that he did in Sweden. Exactly. On the Opus 3 albums. Yeah. And so that was our uh, initial mutual like connection was that he's a part of like the, you know, uh, I think we, we I don't know, we call ourselves something like the, the Bib Rejects or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Jokingly and lovingly. Yeah. You know, uh, but, you know, he, he was, but basically he's on the initial early stuff with Eric. So yeah. we had that in common. And then resonator guitars we had in common as well. We yeah. met because uh, at that point I was uh, I was representing uh, di helping Amistar uh, with some instruments. So I was sort of like uh, distributing a few of them for people yeah. who wanted them. Yeah. And uh, I, I had one that uh, I had like a beautiful style three tricone, and uh, he wanted it, and yeah. uh, so uh, he got it. And we met at Izzy Young's Folklore Center. And my connection to Bert is very much like my connection to you mm. musically, where it's yeah. like, there's so much that, you know, there are people that you play with that you feel like, you know, you have to kind of coddle them or like be out of the way or like, you know, they're, they're, they have a strong personality with the music that you have to mm. kind of like find your way through. And there are some people where the moment that you pick up an instrument and they pick up an instrument, you're like two halves of the same brain. You know yeah. what I mean? One side and the other side and uh, everything that just becomes uh, a, a tumbling uh, joy of yeah. music and notes and uh, and stuff. Bert's like that. I mean, every yeah. time I play with Bert, you know, where it just becomes something in the moment that's beautiful yeah. and new so yeah yeah and accompanying him too like so we've traveled around a lot and we played and you know he switches from guitar to mandolin and he's he's brilliant brilliant finger picker as well yeah slide oh, yeah. player oh yeah so we we switch back and forth and i love accompanying him because you know it's the same thing you know it's like you know when you're when you're playing with a musician of that caliber that knows how to hold down the strings 
yeah. hold down the low end and make like you know the no, the the notes jump off the yeah. neck of the guitar yeah. and then you know you can add something to that that's not in the way something that makes that come alive in a different way yeah. that's you know to me that's uh, remarkable because then it's like you know uh what, what did i used to say uh we we we, I think we, with Eric, we, I, I used to call it uh, the, the beast with, uh, with 20 fingers or something. Like, that. We're like, <laughs> yeah. like we tried, the goal was to be like one musician with 20 fingers. Yeah. You know what I mean? To sound like one person. Exactly. You know, and that's the same thing. And, and that's so like, and so, and that really is a goal, how, how you hear it, how like I hear it with these people. With yeah. Eric uh, as well, um, it was it was really like if you couldn't tell what I was playing, then I was doing the right thing. If you didn't hear another guitar in a way, but if I wasn't playing, you would know it wasn't there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So not oh. like so not like there's all of a sudden you hear like you know a, a sliding riff or a little arpeggio or things like that. No, like you know uh, you know. Uh, just like hanging notes or partial chords or ringing strings or just like the right mm. you know just the right small you know sliding riff just mm. at the end of a phrase where you, it just feels like a you know a continuation yeah you know a, a, of the composition yeah. well, that's... and it's like you don't know you, yeah. it doesn't sound like left left side is is rhythm right side yeah. is lead you know, no, it's not like yeah. that. No, no, that's exactly what I what I uh, thought about you when we uh, started uh, hanging out and playing together and just ending up in those situations where we would jam and all that. You you are one of those people who don't uh, come in with the attitude of "Hey, here I am, listen to me." It's always like uh, "Hey, hey, here we are, listen to us," and that that's that's not so common because even I have some really great friends amongst musicians but some some of their uh, it's not even ego it's just this eagerness to 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 show off to to maybe get this recognition from the audience and then everybody else is just in the way uh, as soon as they sit on the stage and start singing or playing and uh, let's say uh, one of the few people that I uh, haven't expected being so modest and uh, considerate to people they played with was Louisiana Red because when you hear Louisiana Red play solo he's also just it's 150 percent he's all over the place he can do everything he doesn't need anybody else but then all of a sudden he plays with this uh, German uh, boogie woogie piano player uh, Christian Willison in, in Munich and I'm, I'm sitting in, in you know a couple of meters away and listening to that and all of a sudden Red becomes a part of that duo he, he just doesn't play too much he lets uh, the piano player come through and they start you know building the grooves and all that so and that's not so easy uh, some very experienced players cannot do that and sometimes you meet a youngsters who are really considerate of the groove and everything so it's very much yeah i think it's individual it's about the attitude you have towards music and and, and the stuff it's, and it's then, perspective too it's a personal perspective yeah. some people get a certain perspective very early on about playing yeah. and it's a, it's it almost becomes a, a little bit of a defense mechanism when they when they're behind the guitar yeah. behind the instrument and then you know but for me i was fortunate because like that like louisiana red and folks like that i got to learn firsthand from from certain folks you know how to have the conversation yeah. how to listen how to uh uh you know how to not play even yeah exactly. you know but you know and uh and the to me the greatest testament of those uh lessons uh, were the fact that many of these players let me play with them and let mm -hmm. me continue with them and asked for me, you know, and that was all I ever wanted. When, even when I started, uh, before I started doing gigs, I realized that all I ever wanted was to be a part of something with musicians, with these mm -hmm. musicians. I wanted to feel, be accepted 
and to you know be a part of this conversation to yeah. understand you know the blues yeah. and then this this yeah. little thing you said about uh, let's say if you see somebody playing in the first position very solid and, and then you kind of put yourself into the second or the third position of that chord uh, not even that is always good because some people can do the same but they play too much and they play all over <laughs> the, the 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 other person playing in the first position so it needs to be True. this right amount of everything that's done in the groove yeah right? yeah that's right well yeah well that's also because that's also how you hear the i mean a lot of people when they're finger picking on their own they're thinking about that they're finger picking on their own but you know it's like if you're playing the piano you're not thinking about strings uh, under the keys you yeah. know you're playing the melody and the bass notes and the rhythm yeah. things like that but oddly enough a lot of guitar players aren't thinking about the melody and the rhythm and the and the, and the they're thinking about finger picking <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what happens is when you're thinking about the guitar when you're playing the guitar uh when you're playing with someone else who's playing the guitar and thinking about the guitar, <laughs> and you get a lot of guitar stuff going on and not yeah. a lot of musical stuff going on. Uh, and when I say musical good. stuff, and I'm not, I don't say this to put people down, but what I mean is you're not allowing the breath of the music to to allow the sort of the magic to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? When the notes kind of connect and marry each other. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of information, simple, basic information that you can draw from when you're accompanying someone who's a, a full body player. That's it's all right there. You know, there's so much little information and it's all choices. You know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. And, and eventually you, your instinct tells you that there's like there that there are then there's the right choice too. the stuff yeah. that just kind of flows instinctively as well like, yeah I'll, I'll tell you a quick story and i'm not going to tell you the name of the musician but this okay. is a larry johnson story where larry johnson where we, he had a regular gig at this place called terra blues down on bleecker street in new york and here's a perfect example of what we're talking about and i was playing a regular I was playing regularly with him at Terra Blues uh, I think every Wednesday something like that and I was up on stage with him for the whole show and you know we did I played with Larry and then every once in a while there would like be harmonica players or other guitar players that would come in and he would accommodate them and there was a another guitar player at that time who played Terra Blues regularly and he's now probably one of the top acoustic guitar players uh, visibly uh, around, you know, if I, you, you would be like, of course, but anyway, back then he was just, you know, he was getting it together and, uh, you know, reluctantly Larry got him up to play a song with him. Right. And they get up on stage and they got, they're both, they both have their guitars side by side and Larry's like, Oh, what should we play? So I, I can't remember what he played, but it was like a, a little bit of a raggy, Piedmont style blues in the key of C, you know, mm -hmm. like just a regular Piedmont, you know, beautiful picking bass runs yeah. and treble runs. Yeah. He starts playing and then this other guitar player immediately starts playing exactly the same way Larry's <laughs> playing, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Five exactly. seconds, Larry stops playing. And this <laughs> is a full house, right, yeah. of people full house, Larry stops playing, looks at him and goes, what are you doing? What, what the hell are you doing? You can't be playing what I'm playing while I'm playing it when you're playing. He's like, and he's upset and he's yelling at him while he's doing it. He says, and he shakes his head and he starts a song again. And you know, this, this guy, yeah, hints, this guy uh, just sort of hesitates. He's a little bit rattled and he, he picks up the guitar and he starts again and he does exactly the same thing a little bit timidly. Larry stops again and starts like, you know, shouting at him, telling him you can't be, you play something else, but don't play what I'm playing. Yeah. You can't do it. 
it won't work, yeah. you know, and it didn't yeah. work. You know what I mean? No. It's like you got, come on, if you got two people side by side playing like, you know, a finger picking number, you know, yeah. seat at my graves kept clean or something like that, exactly the same thing. What's it going to sound like? It's going to be dissonant. Nobody's yeah. going to be able to hit the same, you know, bass notes at the same time in the same exactly. note. It's going to be a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you got the two greatest guitar players on the planet doing that, they w yeah. it wouldn't really, really work. No, you know, no. unless no. they figured something out and they wouldn't yeah. do that. They wouldn't do yeah. it. So anyway, what happened was uh, this this poor fellow, you know, who who got the last laugh in the end anyway. But, you know, was a, that's a perfect example yeah. of uh, how it's like I get up on stage uh, with Larry again. Larry couldn't wait to get me back on stage to play with him. Why? Because Larry can play his songs and I could play behind him and he could yeah. just feel excited about, you know, like yeah. playing, playing with somebody yeah. that way. Well, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a similar story to, to what I've experienced when, when, let's say, people meet uh, famous guitar players and then they bring them up on stage as, uh, let's say, you, you're on a tour, you come to a country and they have this local hero who is just starting off and all that. And then that guy is, comes, comes up on the stage and starts playing the licks of the guest musician right just to prove oh look i can play your stuff ain't i good yeah. and that's the last thing they, they they want you to play it's like what the hell what's the point but there is this True. especially especially in uh southern or eastern europe where i come from it's very much of emulating exactly how somebody's playing and then they can keep that for like 20 years whereas Actually, this is just a period when you, okay, you, just like I, I tried to play like Doc Watson when I was like 21, 22, but then kind of 10 years later, I realized, okay, this is how he does things. I've learned that and I didn't play the same way he did. Sometimes you do it, but I mean, it's, it's this, uh, it's, it's better to play less and to play, um, I don't know. It's complicated to to explain. Maybe that's that's also one of the reasons why I brought you in because I wanted you to tell it's about these. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you you do things that sound so natural, but it takes a great deal of knowledge and right attitude in order to 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 make the music happen. That's why you're doing this a uh, uh, blues jam. On, on Saturday uh, afternoons in Stockholm, you've been doing it for more than 20 years, right? And, 25 uh, coming up. Tw yeah, 25, which I mean, you you have always enjoyed bringing other people up, uh, uh, giving people a chance, giving people uh, opportunity to grow, develop. And you just, I've seen you many times at that Blues Jam, you, you just, this Swedish word, music. You're just cozy there in the back. You're just enjoying every moment of somebody just coming up there and feeling the yeah. st stage fright and all. You just support them with the right notes so that they can feel safe and, and you know, taken care of. And then they just flourish and start playing. And just, that that's an amazing uh, 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 thing to have. Yeah, thank so, you. So thank I, you. I really well, that's been that. another yeah. important co component for me, for like this uh, in, in this like journey of accompaniment as well. That's been an important uh, component for me because yeah. that's been a humbling experience and lesson for exactly that reason. Because you're put in a position where there's a couple of things. Uh, in Sweden, people don't have the same mentality when they get up on stage to play as they do, let's say, in New York or in America. If you go to a blues jam in New York, you go there with, uh, you know, you go there to basically go to battle. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got to prove yourself, you know, like you're, you're fit to fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're going to go yeah. and you're going to blow. But in Sweden, nobody has that mentality. If people walk into a room to play at an open stage, they're not there to blow. They want. They want to have some. They want to get something out of it. They want to have an experience. They want to even just the fact that they're there yeah. within itself is an accomplishment. So exactly. it, it's humbling because I had to basically um, get 
on board with how to embrace people and make them feel comfortable, make them feel good. And uh, at the same time, you know, be with them in an unpredictable situation where maybe they're not a seasoned professional or maybe they have their own way of playing or maybe their timing isn't quite right. But yeah. I have to put all of that aside and simply connect. Yeah. You know what exactly. I mean? And the language of the blues is a beautiful thing because, you know, it's like I said, if if you can talk to anybody and listen, yeah. then, you know, it's the same thing with the blues and you can talk to anybody and just listen. Yeah. And hopefully, exactly. you know, hopefully the conversation will be something that is very, very valuable for both yeah. of you. Yeah. Oh man, look, it's been a blast. We've passed the hour, but I need something oh, else. What? I want to uh, ask you something. So let's go back to the pictures. Now I'm showing the other part of Brian, Dr. Hyde. You were Dr. Jekyll up till now. Now you're Dr. Hyde. So what Whoa. is this? <laughs> Where did this come oh. from? This talent? Oh my God. That, you really want to know? That was just... Like, you know, I, for those of you who know, I know you know, but I mean, you know, through the COVID period, I've been drawing, of course, uh, yeah. and uh, that's my first talent, but I, I fell in love with art and illustration again, and I just yeah. started drawing, and I've been drawing every day, every day, every day, and it's a big inspiration, and uh, it's always a, a wonderful, wonderful journey. And anyway, this, yeah. is just, this is just something that rolled off, off my pencil, off my pen. Yeah that I had already drawn something through the day and I was done. And I stumbled across a picture of, you know, freaking Blues Brothers. Mm -hmm. And I have okay, a warped brain. I have a warped yeah. brain. So my, my, the way my mind works was they were sitting on the, on the hood of a car. And I just thought to myself, the way they were holding their hands, it looked like I said, hmm, I wonder what they would look like on a tandem bike, on one of those double bikes, <laughs> you know. And I yeah. just, I, I, all I did was ask myself the question, I wonder what they would look on a, ta on a tandem bike. I says, well, why don't we find out and I'll draw it. And this was actually yeah. a very quick drawing. I just, I just like put it together very quickly. And uh, I think it's hilarious. Yeah. yeah, I love you. I love your angle uh, on, on your uh, illustrations. We're going to uh, go through a couple of them. So this is the uh, poster for the uh, weekly Blues Jam that you do yeah, at the that's right. Engelen now in Stockholm. Okay. And now let's soon, see. Soon, go back to that one. Go back to yeah. the other one. Yeah. Soon to be the official Blues Jam t-shirt starting right. next week. So I actually made a limited number of T-shirts with this design that, yeah. you know, like this, is, I have this, this Johnny Winter design. I've made some prototype T-shirts, but I haven't okay. made anything that I wanted to put on a T-shirt that I would be willing to make a lot of T-shirts for. Yeah. Because I okay. don't know who would like what and why and where. Yeah. But with the Blues Jam, I realized I could create an image that really captures yeah, the essence it's, of it. So yeah, it's it's a great image, you know. <laughs> the f f funniest part is I I know the people on <laughs> on the picture. It's like yeah, all right. There's Daniel on bass, and Matt's yeah. on on the harmonica. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so let's go on. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, that's right. Big Bill Bruzy and who? Yeah, exactly. And uh, so uh, I think it's Walter Davis. And yeah. uh, who's the other one? Uh, 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 um, what is Sonny Boy 2? Sonny Boy yeah. Williamson. Yeah. And the thing was, when I first, uh, I this is a picture from my childhood that I love, the original photograph. Yeah. And uh, what I discovered after I put this picture up on social media was that this picture has been uh, uncredited wrongfully for decades. So there's like, they've had different names of different people. It was say in one picture, I think they said it was uh, Roosevelt Sykes or something like that. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, just, yeah. uh, but finally, uh, somebody enlightened me to who the actual musicians were. Yeah. But anyway, this, this is part of like what I love to do. I see an image or an image that struck me as a young man, something like that. And I want to present it in a way that makes you look at it again or makes you appreciate yeah. the artist yeah. in a different way. 
All right, let's go on right. to Brother Ray. Brother Ray. Right. You guys, I don't know what, what resolution you have on your computer, so I'm going to just enlarge this a little bit. Give me a second. So you can see, look at Brother Ray's teeth. <laughs> you get it. That's great. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I just again, I, I, this is the kind. Yeah, yeah this, this is the kind of stuff that I like. I said I, uh, it's a part of my humor and a part of my tribute, and a part of my wanting to find the kernel of the essence of like these yeah. artists, yeah. you know. But we just represent them in a way where you you look at. Everybody, maybe people have seen a photograph of Ray many times. Usually when you look at a picture, you're like, oh, that's a great picture. And then it's gone. Yeah. But it's like when you look at something like this, it makes you go back to look at Ray in a different way. At yeah. least that's my hope. Yeah, exactly. And you have this twist on, on s objects uh, in pictures, the way you incorporate, let's say, the, 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 the limbs. <laughs> And and your signature down there. It's just amazing. I love this next one also. Uh, watch this, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. that's well, amazing. Yeah, because I, I, I know there's an illustrator in, in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, a guy who used to work for Giro in, in France, and he used to uh, draw uh, Lieutenant Blueberry comics in the late 80s and 90s he, he was uh, he, and he did a lot of portraits of blues masters and he made one of little walter when uh, where his microphone was actually plugged into his leg as an amplifier basically Very that cool. was such a great uh, uh, twist on it and then i kind of recognized this man y y y your your mind is totally ah, great. this one yeah so this is i was very happy to do that one yeah, Ray yeah. Cooter and Taj, Taj Mahal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's a great tribute thing as well. for the new record. Yeah, Janice. Acoustic Janice playing guitar. Yeah, acoustic Janice. Yeah, and then we got this. This is one of my favorites as well. Oh this really? A, oh, that's yeah. great. I, I, I revisited that one today. Actually, yeah. Jerry Lee. Yeah. yeah. He's really Fantastic. wrecking the keyboards there. Wrecking them. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted, exactly. I wanted, because, you know, when, when Jerry Lee Lewis played, he rattled the keyboards, right? Yeah. So I really wanted to make him rattling and wrecking. Yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Shake, rattle, and roll, and wrecking, yeah. So here's Muddy, uh, who we Muddy. took uh, for the thumbnail for this live stream. Appreciate that. Advertising. <laughs> it, was, it was great. I mean, I, I, I love it. And then we Something got that Stevie I, Ray yeah. as well. Stevie Ray. Yeah. Something that I really like to do, if you go back to the muddy one for a yeah. second, I'll just explain something Yeah. that I stumbled across with this process. And I don't think this is anything new, you know, in illustration. But for me, um, you know, something that I like doing is like when I do these gray backgrounds, mm -hmm. it's like I try and incorporate the background with like the shading in the face or yeah. in some cases, the shading in the arms or and yeah. I'll, so it's like, it, there's a kind of abstractness to yeah. and it was the same in the Butterfield one with all these like um, triangles oh, yeah. flying yeah. out of him. But then when you when you look a little bit closer, you start to realize that the gray in his face is following a certain proportion, the same way as the background. So you yeah. start to lose the perspective of wait a minute, what's the background and what's the foreground? So I, yeah. I like, I call it chiseling, yeah, kind of like almost like making a sculpture, chiseling out. Yeah. And I have a That's mantra that I'm amazing. saying while I'm doing these pictures because I I have no idea what I'm doing when I'm doing them. No. But yeah. literally, while I'll, I'll be like halfway through and I'm like, I literally I'm saying to myself, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just going to keep doing it. Yeah. And I literally get to a point where it's like I just I don't know. I'm just, but I'm like, I have to figure it out. I have to figure yeah. it out. These pieces take, they can take up to eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah. You know, oh, so man. I'm literally sitting there, you know, like creating these things for eight to 10 hours. And there's yeah. always a point where it's like, it, and it all comes from nothing. There's nothing yeah. planned. It's just yeah. like a, a journey. It's like a blues song in that regard. Yeah. You, you have nothing except three chords. You have your pen, your paper, and, and you're just like your idea. Yeah. 
And then it's, I keep saying, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just going to keep doing it. And then it becomes yeah. this, you know? Yeah. How do you do, you, you do them on paper or do you do them what digitally? What I do is uh, I do them on paper uh, to start. Everything starts on paper and finishes on paper. Oh, okay. And then uh, what I did was I taught myself how to use a pen display and mm -hmm. software because what I wanted to do, because, because during this COVID period, I had no idea what was going to happen, how long it was going to last, things like yeah. that. And there was no music. So basically, I needed, I wanted to like, I had the time to do this. So I wanted to teach myself the skill and I had yeah. the time to do it. So I basically taught myself to navigate software and I sold one of my national guitars and I bought myself a good Wacom pen display. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that I do everything. If you look at this picture, every stroke is if I would do it on paper. I use a pen mm -hmm. and I use ink in the pen display, but it's all by hand. I do not take yeah. any shortcuts. The uh -huh. only difference is that I can format this for media. I can format this for press. I yeah. can format it. Uh, and I taught myself how to do all the formatting and everything. I And the yeah. thing is, for the that prints, was well, an important. Right? Yeah. yeah, for print, for, for anything, for media. And at the same time, when it's done, it's original. And when and I have a high quality printer, and when it comes out of the printer, I continue with ink on the page for the original one. Oh, so okay. it's so everything starts with paper and ends with paper. Okay. You know, so people, some people are confused by this. And they, they sort of say, Oh, but it's computer art. And it's not computer art. It's just no. that it's the technology. Yeah. And the thing is, it's the technology is not the art. And here's a perfect example. When you go into a recording studio with your guitar and you play into a, a digital format, it's not digital music. You're still playing your guitar yeah. and you're still exactly. playing your notes. And that's how I approach art. I'm still drawing. Everything's done completely by hand, but I'm using a formatted media media that is accepted now. It's the generally accepted way for formatting and for mm. publication. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great work. And look, this is what are we going to oh, end, that end with. That guy. <laughs> I love the self-portrait. <laughs> it's really great. That's, yeah, that's great. what I mean also with the background and the foreground. Yeah. So you can see like uh, I chisel out the grays. But at the same time, it's hard to really see if you start looking closely what's the the background and what's the foreground. Yeah. And that, that's intentional in a way. Yeah. Great. Great, man. Hey, thanks for this, listen, Matt. Thanks for this, this was, perk. This was fantastic. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Should we say it. something and, about uh, Malmo, though? About yeah, the Malmo thing? Definitely. It'd be my guest. Yeah. Well, uh, just on um, June. 2nd through June 4th, I have the privilege to be a part of the European um, Blues Challenge in Malmö. And actually, I was a part of that a few years ago with Bert Divert, where we actually performed yeah. and came in third and had a, a blast doing that. But uh, I was asked to uh, come back to the Malmö, uh, the European Blues Challenge in Malmö on uh, June 2nd through 4th to uh, basically have an art gallery through the uh, through the three days of the of the uh, challenge yeah. uh, so i'm going to have a gallery set up of my art i'm going to be performing uh at the gallery and uh, much of the art is going to be available and i'm going to be giving examples with the music and uh, hopefully mr homesick mac will be coming and and joining me and doing a few songs as well for that definitely uh, and we're going to be giving examples of some of the uh people in the drawings you know that people i've known people that have inspired us and things like that yeah, and they're also going to have that. a blues jam yeah so That's i'm going to be man. running a blues jam there too yeah uh this is an organization of uh, malmo copenhagen blues association together with some other organizations in Malmö and even region Skåne. And those of you who came to my retreat know uh, one of the students, 
participants uh, during the retreat, Helkan Selin, who is uh, in charge right. of the Malmo event, uh, uh, region Skåne event part of that organization anyway. So he is very much responsible for the whole thing that it developed into uh, a bit higher level event than it used to be before. So this is kind of, this is a real deal. Yeah. It's great. It's yeah. Great. And I'm honored, right. and it's the first time I'm going to be doing anything like this, so it's mm. going to be interesting. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Look, man, thank you so much for coming and taking the time, and I hope uh, people didn't f fall asleep. No. No, I no. didn't. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's great. But uh, there are going to be a lot of replays of this. Uh, some people who just can't make it live usually watch afterwards and all that. So to you who were with us, thank you for coming. Thank you for hanging out with us. And uh, Brian is uh, continue with his Blues Jams at England. So if you're ever in Stockholm on a Saturday afternoon, then just look him up. And of course, on Facebook, He's very active on Facebook. You can see all his works there as well, the illustrations and stuff. So uh, if you're wondering anything about Brian or me or whatever, just write a comment in the YouTube video uh, on online. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time, next Monday. All right. See you, Brian. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. This is all great. Right. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Don't you shake my tree Get out of my orchard Let my feet just be Now she's gone I don't worry But I'm sitting on top of the world
adorando. Seré 